DW, World in Progress. Welcome to the show. I'm Kathleen Schuster. Coming up, why China's young workers are pumping the brakes on life in the fast lane. What's the point of all this work? What's the value of it all other than earning money? And a special visit to a groundbreaking cafe in Vienna that wants to bridge the gap between the young and old. Also enough to speak with the guests and it's my, it's my family. I'm here alone. Yes, and so I have here I feel my family, but it's good. You're listening to World in Progress. I'm your host, Kathleen Schuster. On this week's show, we're going to hear stories about inspired ideas toward better health, better health for the individual and better health for the community. We begin in China, where a new trend is emerging among the younger workforce. It's known as Tang Ping, or bowing out of the rat race. In other words, quitting well-paying jobs to get away from the 996 work culture. That's 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Instead, they're taking time off to relax and enjoy life. Reporter Eva Lambi Schmidt has this feature. It's presented by Jennifer Collins. Not all that long ago, Zhao Yunqi was often still sitting in her office until 2 in the morning. She's one of the top employees at a renowned international headhunter company in Shanghai. At 29, Zhao Yunqi earns a lot of money for her age. Working six days a week for 12 hours or more is an unwritten rule at her company, just like with many other companies in China. But why? One day, Zhao Yunqi realised she was working without ever having really lived. I'm supposed to feel as if I've achieved something, but it appears as if I haven't achieved anything. What's the point of all this work? What's the value of it all other than earning money? The thing that's missing for her is time. And she's not the only one. The term for this phenomenon is Tang Ping, which literally translates as to lie flat as in to lie on one's back or to need a rest. Figuratively speaking, it's come to mean to opt out of the rat race. So young people set off and they either do nothing at first or they're bursting with curiosity about a side of life they don't know yet. Jessica and Josie escaped the big city. They wanted to leave the fast life behind them. Now they're at a beach in southern China, it's the place where they're happiest and where they have time for things. When we're in the water, it's as if we could forget everything. It's like with scuba diving. When we're underwater, there's no noise, only our breathing. There isn't even a trace of any distracting thoughts in our heads. Here in Shanghai, China's largest metropolis, life is fast paced. The city is a financial symbol of higher, farther, faster. It draws a lot of young people, and settling down here is considered making it. I must be able to support myself if I want to go to Shanghai. So it's a lot of pressure financially. The cost of an apartment is the biggest problem for me. They're rather exorbitant. Xiao Zhongzhi was one of the ones who wanted to move to Shanghai, no matter what. She's a young woman who is self-reliant and ambitious. She's originally from the city of Xi'an, the capital of Shanxi province in north-central China. At roughly 10 million, Xi'an is estimated to have a population on par with major cities like London, but still much smaller than Shanghai. Xiao Zhongzhi studied abroad in Manchester and is seemingly predestined for a good job in China's financial hub Shanghai. She's been living in the city centre for four years now, and she works as a headhunter, a job which takes up at least 72 hours of her week. Our company would never hire anybody that's not ambitious. The outcomes of our work are measured with the help of very rigorous devices. If you can't meet the demands, for example, if you don't deliver results in three months, then you'll be fired. The company might say that you don't have to work overtime. But in reality, they're looking for results. So you need to know what counts. 
But now she says she can't do it anymore. I was about to get another promotion, and then the bosses tried to convince me to keep going. But since I work hard, I don't have time for things like exercise, for example. I noticed some of the signals that my body was sending me, crying out to restore balance. Or at least, if you'd like to work that hard again, you have to watch your physical and mental state. That's why, one Friday, she decided to quit. Effective immediately. Suddenly she's free and doesn't want to do anything for the time being. Instead of her usual business dress for clients, she's wearing casual jogging pants and a baseball cap. All she wants to do is relax to opt out of the rat race, or Tang Ping, as they say in Mandarin. Maybe for a week, maybe for two months, all the while living off her savings. Now I can eat as much as I want. I can watch TV. I don't have to be anxious anymore. Now I can sleep from the morning until late at night for as long as I want. I'm so happy. This is... In a small studio in Shanghai, a woman named Xu Zhao Yi has just finished putting together a small photo album with pictures she developed herself in the dark room. She loves spending time here. She used to paint a lot, mainly oil abstracts on canvas. She learned how to sculpt too. Atop the shelves and tables here in this art studio, there are a lot of sculptures made by art students like herself. There are a number of easels set up on the wooden floors. A portion of the studio became a small corner devoted to floristry during the pandemic. Xu Yi has been listening to her muse for the past two years. She's curious and searching for the thing that fulfills her, something her job was missing. She was sick of the advertising business. You're basically looking at your phone 24 hours a day and are involved in hundreds of chats. I was in contact with clients. I essentially was arguing with other people every day. I wasted my time. I coaxed clients and bosses. All of it made me unhappy. By doing these things, people are wasting part of their lives, their energy and their feelings. Ever since she stopped working, Xu Yi has been keeping her head above water by living off her savings. Books and art seem to be her lifeblood. She wants to read all of the books she didn't have time for before. A lot of it is world literature. I get up at 10 a.m. and then I take the dog for a walk, eat breakfast, and then I start to read a book. In the evening or in the afternoon, I visit an exhibit or I draw alone. Then I have my dinner, continue my book or watch videos. That's how it is, every day. Tang Ping. For Xu Xiaoyi, that term doesn't mean doing nothing. She herself is very active, thirsty for knowledge and curious. She wants to broaden her horizons through art courses and art projects. Some people do in fact spend all their time in bed when they've decided to Tang Ping. Some let their parents take care of them and cook for them, while others keep working a little but stop short of overexerting themselves. The 34-year-old says that Tang Ping is very individual. Everyone does it in his or her own way. That's why she doesn't actually use the term. To me, it makes sense to use labels. They simplify complex problems and give them a name. I'm using the word Tang Ping right now so you can understand quickly. But in other cases, I wouldn't necessarily use that word. I don't know how other people who decided to Tang Ping are doing. I actually also don't get what other people are going for who only work and aren't going for Tang Ping. The phenomenon known as Tang Ping began in the spring of 2021 with a Chinese blog post about lying flat is justice. Someone who used to work in a factory described how his life had changed after quitting his job. He cycled more than 2,000 kilometres across China, living off his savings and the money he got from smaller jobs. His approach to life was celebrated by some young people online as a manifesto against a society driven by overconsumption and the higher, father, faster of the Chinese economy. For more and more Chinese men and women, greater wealth doesn't necessarily mean a better quality of life. Bao Tiang, 
is a social anthropologist who teaches at the Max Planck Institute in Halle, Germany. Here's how he explains the trend. It basically means that you put more and more effort endlessly. And it's a very tiring process, but with no real meaning. And often it refers to a situation that you are forced, you know, pressurized to participate in competition uh, without any uh, end in sight. Over time, and the 996 work culture, 996 refers to working from 9 in the morning until 9 at night, six days a week. But Tang Ping also has to do with China's one-child policy. Since 1979, families have usually had just one child. And as a result, there are more people retiring than there are younger workers to take their place. These young workers have to work longer and do overtime to accomplish the same amount or more than previous generations. Fu Yixian dealt with Chinese demographics as a professor of obstetrics and gynaecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the US. China's one-child policy led to polarization. Some children are very competitive because they've received a good education. They also have a sense of the crisis because they carry the weight of their parents' hopes on their shoulders, and they must support their parents in their future on their own. Other children are dependent on their parents, resting at the expense of the older generation. There are some people who still believe that hard work will lead to a better tomorrow, as was the case in China for decades. But others from Generation Y people who fall somewhere between 20 and 40, are giving up on the social contract. China's young people have faced serious pressure as only children their entire lives, especially from their parents. Their one and only child has to be the best, in kindergarten, in school and in their field. That's why many parents invest a lot of money to this day in tutoring and helping their kids advance. My child can play 40 songs on the piano, but then another mother says that her son can play 60 songs. I start to feel a lot of pressure because other children are achieving more. Josie Away is sitting in the living room of her four-room apartment located outside of central Shanghai. There isn't much room here. The piano stands directly across from the front door. In the living room, there's a glass cabinet with colourful figurines, and next to it, a couch and a table. She used to work in the aviation industry, which is why there are so many model aeroplanes on the chest of drawers. Now in her mid-40s, she's a housewife and a mother. She talks about the pressure weighing on parents. Her son, Yan Bo, will start school in a few months. For the past two years, he's had a full schedule, every day. Aside from kindergarten, he goes to piano lessons, swimming class, art class and English class. Add to that the homework he can do on his tablet. The learning software is called Zebra and presents the kids with units to finish Monday to Friday. They always start with a short cartoon in English for listening comprehension. We have so much left. Yan Bo is six years old and can already read two different writing systems. The Roman alphabet for English and some of the characters used in Chinese. I have many feelings. Yanbo's mother says it's important for him to speak both languages well. Our plan is to send him abroad for university. The earlier he learns English, the better. Otherwise, it'll be difficult for him later on. Yanbo says he likes studying English. And he wants to become a veterinarian later and says knowing English will be helpful. He especially likes tigers and dinosaurs. And he's already started looking after turtles and small crabs in his free time. He keeps them in a small aquarium. Mm. Yan Bo's many activities and instructors outside of kindergarten cost his family a lot of money. We pay a lot of money for his classes. A painting class costs 300 yuan an hour. Two swimming classes a week cost more than 400 yuan. Two hours of English a week cost more than 500. And then there's the amount of time it all takes because we have to take him there. He's too young to go by himself. My husband and I take turns taking him. That all adds up to roughly 1,000 euros a month that goes into a child's education. 
This family has doubled the expenditure because they have two sons. That chunk of money accounts for the lion's share of what one parent earns on average in China. Supporting two children is not the norm in China, but the year Yan Bo was born was the year China abolished its one-child policy. China's state and party leadership did it in the hopes of raising the birth rate in a rapidly ageing country. But many aren't able and don't want to provide for a second child. Many children stay only children, and the problems of the one-child policy end up weighing heavily on society. For example, when it comes to the pressure to perform. <laughs> Meeting up with friends once a month to play pool and have fun is everything to Mei Chi Hung. Mathematics is a huge part of it. And even when he's out and having fun, this 17-year-old still likes to think about mathematics. At what angle does he need to hit the ball? He loves it. Most of the time, Mei Chi Hong is at school or sitting at his desk at home. He's about to graduate, and now he has to give it his all to have the opportunity to study at a Chinese university. Every year at our school, the best 20 to 30 graduates can go to university. There are about 120 students in a grade. I placed third for the last midterm exam, so that's a relatively good position. Still, those are just numbers. What really counts is a single test that's considered the hardest one for young people in China. It's called the Gao Kao, the university entrance exam. Students are tested in six different subjects, English, Chinese language and literature, math, and three subjects chosen by the student themselves. Mei Chi Hong is already studying for it. In a few months, it'll be his turn to take it. Of course, I'm nervous. Sometimes I'm too nervous to sleep, even before the midterm and the final exams. Our teacher always said that nerves can even be helpful for getting a good grade, but I usually can't sleep before tests. Sometimes I take a sleeping pill. There's a specific kind of tension that spreads ahead of the university entrance exam. The teachers are more demanding. Some even require more homework. Others are more demanding in class in order to help us prepare better for the exam. Mei Chi Hong works on his homework until 10 at night, sometimes even until midnight. And that's after an 11-hour day at school that ends at 6 p.m. All that's left to do after dinner is homework, and then it's time for bed. Mai Chi Hong has class on the weekend too. Not because his grades are bad, he goes to class to become an even better student. Before, my parents decided for me about whether or not I'd received tutoring because they thought I needed to improve. Once I started my final years of high school, I was studying for my own good and decided myself which classes to take. I think I can improve in English and maths. I'm not as strong at English, so I hope I can reach an average level. He talks about this modestly, in terms of how his classmates deal with the pressure to perform. He says some are better at it, and others worse. He says teachers are getting better at being sensitive to the consequences this kind of pressure can have on students. If you're unwell, the teacher will advise you to talk with your parents, and he'll tell your parents not to put you under so much pressure. Actually, our teachers are working hard to pay more attention to our mental health. At his school, grades aren't posted on the bulletin board for all to see, as used to be the case in China. At our school, you have to go to the principal if you want to find out where you rank compared to the other students. This experience for competition, starting in kindergarten, then school and later at work, weighs heavily on some once they are adults. They're leaving it all behind. During my time in Huangzhou, I felt like I hadn't gotten enough sleep. I was at work quite a bit. Jessica Z and her husband left the city for the seaside. Jessica used to work in patient management for a hospital in Hangzhou, a city of 10 million people on China's eastern coast. I used to come into contact with sick people in the hospital. I also came into contact with some rich people too. 
they weren't doing very well despite having more money. Time is more important than money. We have to get more out of life so that we can experience more happiness. So that's how the two 30-somethings ended up moving to a small village near the city of Haikou, located on the southern Chinese island of Hainan, and making one of their dreams come true. What's our favourite thing to do? Going surfing with friends and then enjoying the breeze on the pier and watching the stars. Most of the time you can see the stars here on the island of Hainan. It's really healing. The couple opened a cafe to make a living. They know others have done something similar. A lot of people come here to surf, but not many of them really leave their work behind them. I think the proportion of people doing the same thing as us is relatively small. A lot of people couldn't just give up their lifestyle. Back in Shanghai, Xu Yi says she still has a lot of art projects in mind that she hasn't completed yet. There are so many books she still wants to read during her Tangping break. But she doesn't want to give up her life in the city completely. She says even her job will be back at some point. Once my savings are gone, I might need to go back to work after all. But I don't think I've hit that point yet. I don't know, maybe in a year or two? And for the ambitious headhunter, Xiao Yunxi, the self-imposed break didn't work out in the end which she says she almost predicted herself. I don't think I'm the type who can sit around without thinking about anything. <laughs> she managed not to do anything for three weeks, and then she got a new job, a better one, more money, less work. After all, that's all she ever really wanted. Jennifer Collins with that report by Ava Lambie-Schmidt. You're listening to World in Progress with me, Kathleen Schuster. Time for a quick music break. You're listening to World in Progress with me, Kathleen Schuster. A big component of good health is social connection, and making that connection happen was a big part of the idea behind a groundbreaking cafe in Vienna called Vollpension. It's a place that brings the young and old together with noticeable benefits for both groups. Reporter Heidi Fuller Love has more. Just one of a long line of bars and cafes in Vienna's fourth district. From the outside, there's little to distinguish Vol Pension from the others. Descend a few steps and open the door to the cafe, however, and it's like entering another world where cheery orpas or granddads and charming omas or grandmas chat with young students and families perched on cushioned seats surrounded by old gramophones and sepia photos on walls and vintage furnishings. And over it all hangs the comfort odours of coffee and delicious homemade cake, including Vienna's classic sponge cake, I'm here to meet 36-year-old David Haller, one of the co-founders of Full Pension, or Full Pension, a groundbreaking social cafe project in the Austrian capital, where the city's old-age pensioners can top up their pensions by as much as 40%, whilst actively getting involved in society, making new friends and mingling with young people as they cook meals and give baking lessons. With a lively mix of both young and senior staff, ranging from the ages of 18 to 80 and hailing from all regions of Austria, diversity is definitely the name of the game here. We are sort of a public living room where the generations come together. We are an intergenerational coffee house and the idea is to uh, create jobs for elderly people so they can earn some money uh, through their pension. And uh, the, we have grandmas and grandpas here who bake cakes in an open kitchen. So you can go there, you can watch, you can chat with them. 
So it's all about bringing the generations together and uh, learning from each other. The idea, which started as a pop-up in 2012, sprang from a very personal place. I, like I always said, I always had a, a really deep connection with my grandmother. She passed away last year at 91, but she also worked here, so that, that made it even more, more special for me. Um, we just started it because we said, well, we need a place where the generations come together and where you get good cakes. It, it, it's much more than, than the cake, it's, it's, it's the feeling that comes with it, it's the love with which it's made. Soon, however, he realised that Folle Pension was a lot more than just a place to bring generations together. As David explains, it corresponded to a real felt need in society. And then after a while we found out, well, there's a big, big theme behind when it comes to um, isolation, poverty when you're older, so that's... And that's, of course, something we're, we're emphasizing now. The, the reasons why the people come here and work here are completely... Everybody has his own reasons, but most of them come here because they need the money and their pension is so low. We have coffee and cake. Yeah. It's for time one hour. We have two breakfast, mm -hmm. one uh, 90 minutes, small breakfast and big breakfast. It's normally with eggs and ham... And yes, One of the I first grandmas to start yes, working at Vol Pension eight and a half uh, years ago, 78-year-old Marianne yes, is one of the regular hosts. Yes, I, I like this place, but I'm alone, I'm a singer. Yeah? And uh, life at now is so expensive, yes? And so, therefore, I worked here for money. But also I love to speak with the guests and it's my, it's my family. I'm here alone. Yes, and so I have here, I have here my family, but it's good. <laughs> I'm also amateur actress, this is here my theatre. And it's not just older people who love Folle Pension. For homesick travellers and young students who are far from their families, Folle Pension is a refuge too. As Annette, who's originally from Munich, can testify. Both of my grandmothers died um, in the last six months, which is uh, very sad because we were so close. And for me also, knowing that I could be in contact with uh, that generation again is so important. Well, it's very different opinions and views on the world as well. And um, getting advice from someone who's already lived for, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years um, is quite special and very different from advice from someone who's my age. Yes, very enriching, yeah. This groundbreaking project might have started here in Vienna, but with increasing interest from around the world, Fol Pension, an innovative scheme to bridge the generation gap whilst helping seniors beat loneliness and live decently, could soon be a global phenomenon. Watch this space. You're listening to World in Progress with me, Kathleen Schuster. Time for a quick message from the DW original podcast, Cannabis Cowboys. I'm Andreas Becker. I'm Nicholas Martin. This is the story of the biggest cannabis scam ever. This is the story of Juicy Fields. I've lost 20K. I had 350,000 euros in the account. And the scam might just continue. We have owners that sometimes like to be flashy, hence why they like cannabis and crypto. Money, money green, you know, like everybody likes money. In this investigative podcast series, we entered a world that we never expected to find. It bears all the trademarks, the Russian mafia. It's a fantasy. People want that the Russian is the very best. Stop fantasy. This is Cannabis Cowboys, a story about big dreams, juicy money, and never-ending hype. Find Cannabis Cowboys wherever you get your podcasts. And that's all we have for you on this week's show. To listen back to this and past episodes of World in Progress, you can go to our website, dw.com, or follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. In the meantime, if you have any feedback or questions, you can send us an email at worldinprogress at dw.com. This week's show was produced by me, Kathleen Schuster. Our sound engineer was Gad Georgi. Be sure to tune in again next week. World in Progress is produced by DW in Bonn, Germany.